From ancient origins to Churchill, who popularised the Victorian phrase, the black dog on your back, the concept of the spectral black dog as a portent of doom, death and catastrophe is one that has maintained with a constant slow progression throughout centuries. From musty old tomes maintained in cold, damp monasteries to the pages of Harry Potter, the black dog, old Chuck, the bar guest, the guy trash and the scriker have haunted the stories of our rural landscapes and worked their way into the global imagination like almost nothing else in popular folklore. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark History, Season 7, Episode 1. Welcome to the new season. It's always great to be back. It's always great to have had a little bit of time off in uh, December, but I'm always itching to get back on the microphone and uh, get episodes out uh, by about halfway through the break, as always. True to form, I uh, managed to come down with the flu thing that's been going around, so my voice is a little bit off today. I have saved the recording of this episode to the last possible moment so that I could get rid of as much sort of congestion as possible and I will do my best to uh, filter out any cold like sounds uh, that might get picked up on the mic but hopefully it won't be too much of a problem. So anyway first episode of the season I don't really like to do all the begging and stuff throughout the year but you know because it's the first episode of the year do just want to chuck out a little request um if you'd like to review the show um, on whatever platform you use, if it, whether that be like Apple or Spotify or whatever, then that'd be really great and really useful. Um, and of course, if, you, if you'd if like to support the show, um, I do have a patron. There's a whole bunch of stuff on there now. It's been running for years. So, you know, there's a quite a backlog of things on there. And, you know, this year there's going to be monthly live streams on that and things like that. I don't really like sort of pushing this stuff too much. And luckily, you know, I, I don't really feel like I need to a lot of the time because, you know, pe- people just do review and it and it's always great. Um, and, and I have a really strong support on Patreon and it's, you know, so I'm incredibly fortunate that I don't really sort of have to sort of bang on about it too much. But, you know, since it's episode one of a new season, um, I'll get it all out of my system now and then we can crack on for the rest of the season. So anyway, let's get on with it after that little, um, I, that, that's my sales pitch. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd make a good salesman, but uh, there you go. Uh, so let's, let's get into this episode. This episode is called The Black Dog of Bungay and Other Spectral Beasts. Standing over Hugo and plucking at his throat, There stood a foul thing, a great black beast, shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that ever mortal eye had rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing tore the throat out of Hugo Baskerville, on which, as it turned its blazing eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life, still screaming across the moor. One, it is said, died that very night of what he had seen, and the other were but broken men for the rest of their days. Such is the tale, my sons, of the coming of the hound, which is said to have plagued the family so sorely ever since. The description of Arthur Conan Doyle's beast from the Hound of the Baskervilles, roaming across the moors, created an image of one of the Victorian period's most iconic monsters, sharing the upper ranks, along with the ghost of Peter Quint, Dracula and Mr Hyde. Though this appearance in fiction saw the hound launched into the spotlight, it was not a monster born of pure imagination, and images of black dogs were already an ingrained aspect of Victorian folklore for many centuries before the serialisation of the Conan Doyle classic in 1901. Far from man's best friend, the image of the wild carrion feeders scavenging on carcasses to survive have, for a much longer period of time, been associated with subjects related to the afterlife and the realm of the underworld, Known throughout the British Isles, and to a lesser extent across mainland Europe as the Black Shuck, the Galley Trot, the Padfoot and the Barguest, they are all legends of demonic black dogs that had been heavily ingrained within British pagan folklore for generations and wider global mythology long before that. In Greek mythology, the underworld realm of Hades is guided by Cerberus, a horrifically monstrous three-headed dog with a snake for a tail, who devoured any soul attempting to escape back to the land of the living. In Norse mythology, Garm, 
depicted as both a wolf and a bloodstained dog, whose job, similarly to Cerberus, was to guard the gates of hell, had a howl that he used to beckon the coming Ragnarok, the cataclysmic destruction of the cosmos. In Welsh pagan folklore, the Cunanuvan are black dogs with glowing red eyes and red ears that guard the fairy underworld as prophets of doom and death stalking in the shadows. The only people to have seen them have done so only out of the corners of their eyes, and doing so has signalled their final days before the dogs would be back to shepherd them to the afterlife. The very earliest stories of black dogs that relate to the more modern interpretation that developed fully in the Victorian period were those related to the wild hunts, an early folklore motif that spread right across Europe. The wild hunt featured a ghost-like army of men and animals that appeared in the skies, often led by a mythical figure such as Herod, Odin, the devil, or a legendary king pertaining to the author. The hunt signalled a dark omen and the coming of catastrophe and death. Described in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a series of manuscripts penned in a collaborative fashion by monks across England throughout the 9th to 12th centuries, the wild hunt paints a frightening image. Let no one be surprised at the truth of what we are about to relate, for it was common knowledge throughout the whole country that immediately after the arrival of Abbot Henry Pateau at Peterborough Abbey, many men both saw and heard a great number of huntsmen hunting. The huntsmen were black, huge and hideous, and rode on black horses and on black he-goats, and the hounds were jet black, with eyes like saucers and horrible. These hellhounds were quickly capitalised upon across Britain, and soon the hunts were morphing into religious warnings, the dogs chasing the souls of sinners, or those of the unbaptised heathens and the unwashed pagans. Rarely spotted in daylight, and almost always in desolate rural landscapes and lonely countryside trails, sightings of demonic dogs continued for centuries, evolving alongside the belief of witches, black magic, demonology and the devil himself, and melding with various localised beliefs, folklore, legends and fiction, bleeding out into the societies within which they were ingrained. Conan Doyle's story itself is said to have been heavily influenced by a string of real-life black dog sightings, with one in particular centering around the 17th century English squire, Richard Cabell. Living in Brook Manor, a large three-storey manor house resting on the edges of Dartmoor National Park in Devon, southwest England, the Cabell family were well-known and hugely wealthy, owning significant swathes of property and land. After fighting on the side of the Royalists during the Civil War, Richard Cabell was spuriously rumoured to have murdered his wife and his local reputation was not one of glittering positivity. Most people considered him a violent and evil man who predominantly spent his time hunting, living in general immorality and talking to the devil, with whom it was said he had sold his soul. Real life shifts to legend and slips into considerably more murky territory around the time of his death, when some tales have it said that he was chased to his death by a pack of black dogs sent by the devil to claim his soul. Others say he died a much more peaceful death, passing away quietly in his bedroom at home but the black dogs still made an appearance, showing up in the windows of Brook Manor, their red eyes glowing into the night and their howls signalling his passing to the locals. Stranger still was the presence of Carbell's ghost that appeared as the leader of a great pack of spectral black dogs running the wild hunt through the local countryside on the anniversary of his death each year. The terrifying collection of ghostly beasts scared the locals so much so that they eventually placed a large white stone slab upon Cabell's grave, which was then encased within a peculiar little mausoleum, complete with a row of iron bars for a window in one of its four stone walls. Whilst it is one of the most famous due to its associations with Sherlock Holmes, it is far from the earliest, and over 300 years before Conan Doyle had even began to imagine the terrors of the moor, a zealous Protestant minister named Abraham Fleming was writing his own tale of canine demonism published in a 12-page pamphlet in 1577. Emblazoned on the front page was a wood block print, silhouette in a large black dog figure with wide, long-clawed feet beneath the intentionally tabloid title, A Strange and Terrible Wonder, wrought very late in the parish church of Bungay. With a population of around 5,000, Bungay is a small country town nestled on the border of Norfolk and Suffolk, 20 miles from the east coast of England and 120 miles northeast of London. St Mary's Church, nestled behind a large churchyard full with crumbling headstones, sits just off the rural high street 
strikes through the centre of the village. Its steeples sit high on the landscape atop a vast grey stone square tower visible above the roofs of the one and two storey buildings that encircle it. The principal drive of Fleming's story was the damage caused to the tall building by lightning strikes during a thunderstorm that took place on the morning of 4th of August 1577, killing two members of the parish, John Fuller and Adam Walker, who were ringing the church bells in order to ward off the evil spirits that were bringing the storm. An innately dangerous practice that had roots in Roman times and had fully taken off during the Middle Ages when it was believed that demons and devils were afraid of the sound and could be chased away by the reverberating bells. According to Fleming, it was a very particular demon that visited the church that day and had caused the commotion and taken the lives of the bell ringers. Sunday being the 4th of this August in the year of our Lord, 1577. To the amazing and singular astonishment of the present beholders and absent hearers at a certain town called Bungay, not past ten miles distant from the city of Norwich, there fell from heaven an exceedingly great and terrible tempest. Between nine o'clock in the morning and ten of the day aforesaid, this tempest took beginning with a rain which fell with a wonderful force and with no less violence than abundance, which made the storms so much the more extreme and terrible. This tempest was not simply of rain, but also of lightning and thunder, the flashing of the one whereof was so rare and vehement, and the roaring noise of the other so forcible and violent, that it made not only people perplexed in mind and at their wit's end, but ministered such strange and unaccustomed cause of fear, to be conceived that dumb creatures, with the horror of that which fortuned, were exceedingly disquieted and senseless things, void of all life and feeling, shook and trembled. There were assembled at the same season to hear divine service and common prayer, according to order, in the parish church of the said town of Bungay, the people thereabouts inhabiting, who were witnesses of the strangeness, the rareness and soddenness of the storm, consisting of rain violently falling, fearful dashes of lightning and terrible cracks of thunder, which came with such unwanted force and power that the perceiving of the people at the time and in the place above named assembled, the church did as it were quake and stagger, which struck into the hearts of those that were present such a sure and sudden fear that they were in a manner robbed of their right wits. Immediately hereon there appeared in a most horrible similitude and likeness to the congregation, then there present a dog, as they might discern it, of a black colour. At the sight whereof, together with the fearful flashes of fire, which then were seen moved such admiration in the minds of the assembly, that they thought doomsday was already come. This black dog, or the devil in such a likeness, running all along the body of the church with great swiftness and incredible haste, among the people in a visible form and shape, passed between two persons, as they were kneeling upon their knees, and occupied in prayer as it seemed, wrung the necks of them both at one instant, clean backwards in so much that even at a moment where they kneeled, they strangely died. Fleming was quite clear about why the black dog had visited the church putting it to his readers in no uncertain terms that this is a wonderful example of God's wrath, no doubt to terrify us that we might fear him for his justice or pulling back our footsteps from the paths of sin to love him for his mercy. As if to hammer his point home, he then continues his story of the dog's rampage through the church. To our matter again, there was at the same time another wonder wrought for the same black dog still continuing and remaining in one of the self-same shape passing by another man of the congregation in the church gave him such a gripe on the back that therewith all he was presently drawn together and shrunk up as if it were a piece of leather scorched in a hot fire or as the mouth of a purse or bag drawn together with a string the man albeit he was in so strange a taking died not but as it is thought is yet alive which thing is marvellous in the eyes of men and, offer, and offereth much matter of amazing in the mind. Moreover and beside, the clerk of the said church, being occupied in cleansing the gutter of the church with a violent clap of thunder, was smitten down, and besides his fall had no further harm, unto whom being all amazed this strange shape, whereof we have before spoken, appeared, howbeit he escaped without danger, which might, peradventure, seem to sound against truth, and to be a thing incredible, but let us leave thus, or thus to judge, and cry out with the prophet, O Domain, O Lord, how wonderful art thou in thy works. 
at the time that these things in this order happened, the rector, or curate of the church, being partaker of the people's perplexity, seeing what was seen and done, comforted the people and exhorted them to prayer, whole council in such extreme distress they followed, and prayed to God as they were assembled together. Now, for the verifying of this report, as testimonies and witnesses of the force which rested in this strange-shaped thing, there are remaining in the stones of the church and likewise in the church door, which are marvellously rented and toned, the marks as if it were of his claws or talons. Beside that, all the wires, the wheels and other things belonging to the clock were wrung in sunder and broken in pieces. And at that time that this tempest lasted, and whilst these storms endured, the whole church was so darkened, yea, with such a palpable darkness, that one person could not perceive another, neither yet might discern any light at all, though were it lesser than the least, but only when the great flashing of fire and lightning appeared. These things are not lightly with violence to be overpassed, but precisely and thoroughly to be considered. All told, this was quite a remarkable account, but how much of it is actually true? The storm certainly happened, as did the two men's deaths, though the records that exist attribute them to the tempest. Scorch marks from the lightning strikes on the church vestry door, still hanging in situ today, can be clearly seen. And two years after the storm, there are work records of a carpenter, paid for a week to repair the damage that happened to the large church windows during the storm. All of these records, however, make no mention of any dog, and only ever reference the storm as never was seen the like, and never to be forgotten. Curiously, Fleming never actually visited Bungay himself, and was definitely not there on the day of the storm, so his contact with any actual eyewitnesses, as he claimed were the source of this story, would have probably been fairly limited, and it would have been much more likely that he had heard the story after it had travelled through several parishes, morphing all along the way to London, where Fleming was born in 1552. The rector had schooled in Cambridge and was ordained as priest in a church within the capital shortly after. There he taught a Calvinist branch of strict Protestantism, clearly seen in his pamphlet with God displaying his true glory, both in acts of love and wrath, where severe punishments were dished out upon those sinners not seeking redemption. Whether or not the story was true, though, or if Fleming believed the story to be true, or if he just thought it all sounded like a very good story to create his religious narrative, it is the story that becomes the main feature. The pamphlet, despite quickly disappearing into obscurity following its limited publication, did manage to quietly survive, thanks to the strength of the black dog image in the public imagination. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, during the peak of the witch trials that stained much of the UK, tales of black dogs similarly flared and survived. One story from 1751 is unique, however, not only in that it features the drowning of a witch almost 20 years after the laws had been changed, removing witchcraft as a criminal act, but also due to its inclusion of a spectral black dog, which shows just how persistent a motive it had become. In 1735, the Witchcraft Act was signed into English law, making it a criminal offence to accuse someone of practising witchcraft in efforts to bring to an end the long-running hunting and execution of witches across the British Isles. This law also set out to establish in the popular mind that there were no real witches and no real black magic in nature, and whilst it did manage to signal the end of the British witch trials, it was not unanimously successful, especially in more rural areas of the country. In 1751, Ruth and John Osborne were a destitute elderly couple living in a workhouse in Tring, an old market town 30 miles northwest of London. Their existence was fairly pitiful, and devoid of any marketable skills or education, they scraped together the money to pay for their beds in the local workhouse by begging and scavenging food where they could. Ruth had been out begging by the nearby farm of John Butterfield, a local farmer who didn't take too kindly to Ruth nor her husband, and when he turfed them from his land, Ruth responded to his aggression in kind by abusing John and cursing his pigs. The angry outbursts of a desperate old woman would normally have caused little stir, but problems came down for Ruth when, in the days following her ejection from the farm, Butterfield's calves fell ill and he himself began suffering from fits due to his contracting of cholera. Deciding that he'd obviously been hexed by Ruth, who was clearly a witch, Butterfield sought out the advice of a white witch who happily confirmed his suspicions for a pretty penny. Butterfield returned to his farm, but not before he employed a group of six local men to stand guard around his property. Such was his paranoia. 
the men themselves were little better, and they only agreed to pull guard duty after Butterfield had purchased them charms against Ruth's evil magic, which they would wear whilst on the job. Eventually, suspicion in the local area was enough that by mid-April of that year, the old couple found themselves at the centre of a public ducking, an event that, for all intents and purposes, should have been illegal. However, it didn't seem to bother the locals, who turned out in their thousands to enjoy the festivities. Ruth and John Osborne did manage to gain temporary sanctuary in a nearby church, but when the bustling hordes came down on the governor, John Tompkins, and threatened them that they would burn his workhouse down with him inside if he did not produce the old couple for trial, Tompkins quickly capitulated and directed the mob to the church, which they stormed, uncovered Ruth and John, and dragged them out down to the village pond. There, they were stripped naked, pushed onto their knees, had their hands tied to their feet, and were wrapped in an old cloth. They were then ducked into the water. This consisted of being strapped to a wooden stool where they were lowered into the water on the end of a seesaw-like contraption, or, in more primitive cases, tied at the waist with a length of rope and just tossed into the water. There they were dragged around back and forth, hoisted out for a moment to catch their breath, and then plunged back in for a further ducking. It was a punishment that was mainly intended to humiliate and demoralise, but were often used for the secondary purpose of identifying a witch, when in true Monty Python logic, a suspect was deemed guilty of witchcraft if they floated in the water once they were ducked. Ruth was tragically killed during her ducking, drowned in the water as she was hauled around, and John fared only a little better, surviving his ducking but dying shortly after as a direct result of the practice. One of the principal duckers had been a local chimney sweep named Thomas Colley. Colley had stuffed Ruth beneath the surface of the water with a long stick before dancing through the crowds, hat outstretched, to collect money for the ducking of the witch, which was gladly handed over to the hero of the day. Unfortunately for Colley, however, the officials thought much less of his actions, and once word got around, he found himself rounded up with 21 others by law enforcement. As one of the most rowdy members of the group, Collie found himself on the other end of the sword, and he was tried as the fool guy for the entire group. He was quickly found guilty, despite ensuring the court that he did not believe in the power of witchcraft, and he was sentenced to death by being hanged at the site of the murder. On the 22nd of August, 1751, he was marched to his fate at 10am. A signed declaration was read to the crowds, ensuring the reason for his punishment was clear to all. Good people... I beseech you all to take warning by an unhappy man's suffering, that you be not deluded into so absurd and wicked a conceit as to believe that there are any such beings upon earth as witches. I am fully convinced of my former error, and with the sincerity of a dying man, declare that I do not believe that there is such a thing in being as a witch, and I pray God that none of you, through a contrary persuasion, may hereafter be induced to think that you have a right in any shape to persecute, much less in danger, the life of a fellow creature. So exhorteth you all, the dying Thomas Colley. His body was left on the gibbet, swinging in the breeze over the surface of the still water, in the hopes that it would serve as a warning to those that still attempted to practice the old ways. Whilst his body remained, and for some time after it had been dragged down and discarded, reports filtered throughout the village that Colley's ghost had been spotted patrolling the pond in the form of a great black dog. The schoolmaster gave his own account after he had seen the dog whilst walking home late one night. I was returning home late at night in a jig with the person who was driving. When we came near the spot where a portion of the gibbet had lately stood, we saw on the bank of the roadside, along which a ditch or narrow brook runs, a flame of fire as large as a man's hat. What's that? I exclaimed. Hush, said my companion, all in a tremble, and suddenly, pulling in his horse, made a dead stop. I then saw an immense black dog lying on the road just in front of our horse, which also appeared trembling with fright. The dog was the strangest looking creature I ever beheld. He was as big as a Newfoundland, but very gaunt, shaggy with long ears and tail, eyes like balls of fire, and large long teeth, for he opened his mouth and seemed to grin at us. He looked more like a fiend than a dog, and I trembled as much as my companion. In a few minutes the dog disappeared seeming to vanish like a shadow, or to sink into the earth, and we drove on over the spot where he had lain. The dog never attacked or caused any harm, but roamed the area for a time after the hanging, before disappearing, never to be seen again. 
Meanwhile, back in East Anglia, the eastern area of England, famous for spawning Matthew Hopkins, a strong belief in the vision of the black dog continued to progress, and Bungay was eventually shown to be far from an isolated case. Old Shuck, a cyclopic four-legged beast who many believe was the embodiment of the devil, had been at the centre of hundreds, if not thousands, of sightings over the later centuries. He takes the form of a huge black dog and prowls along dark lanes and lonesome field footpaths where, although his howling makes the hearer's blood run cold, his footfalls make no sound. You may know him at once should you see him by his fiery eye. He has but one, and that, like the cyclops, is in the middle of his head. But such an encounter might bring you the worst of luck. It is even said that to meet him is to be warned that your death will occur before the end of the year. Commonly seen stalking throughout churchyards before disappearing into the night, leaving scorched earth and the smell of brimstone behind, Old Shuck had as many names as he had appearances throughout the region and was almost always associated with devils and witchcraft. In 1645, Thomas and Mary Everard were two of the 18 executed during a mass trial of over 100 witches in Bury St Edmunds by the infamous Matthew Hopkins, the witchfinder general himself. Thomas Everard had been a cooper in the East Anglian village of Halesworth, who, along with his wife, were employed in the local brewery. During the trials, they freely admitted to having bewitched the beer so that the odiousness of the infectious stink of it as such and so intolerable that by the noisomeness of the semel or the taste, many people died. Thomas also confessed to having seen a black dog jump across his path whilst he was on his way home one night. The dog had made no noise, silently crossed the road and leapt over a hedgerow, disappearing into the fields beyond. The sight caused such fear in his own dog, who was walking by his side, that he dug his heels into the mud and refused to budge until Thomas was forced to pick him up and carry him past the spot on the path where the black dog had crossed. That night, whilst drifting off to sleep, Thomas was visited in a dream by the dog, who asked him to follow him and deny God. Though the man initially refused the animal's fairly odd request, he eventually decided it was worth a shot when he was visited and attacked by the same dog whilst he was in a field several days later. It scratched him under his ear and got blood of him and said, now it had what it would have, that he had teats and that the imps sucked at those teats, that he sent his imps to kill a deer and a rotten sheep. Thomas's bizarre alliance with the demonic black dog was put to prompt end following the trial when he was executed along with 17 other suspected witches, 16 of which were women. As the Enlightenment slowly crept across the country, tales of the black dog did move away from their typically demonic and devilish explanations and moved into a new era, looping back to something more pagan and reactionary in opposition to the rapid industrialization and urbanisation of the British landscape, growing into something that showed how deeply ingrained it was in the folklore of the nation. In the 19th century, the Black Dog of Bungay itself was brought to light once more, when in 1826, Fleming's story was unearthed by Thomas Rodd, an English antiquarian and keen book dealer who, after obtaining a copy, republished the original pamphlet and flourished it with a fine woodblock print of a black dog tearing through the church, which helped to cement the story forever amongst what was fast becoming a rapidly growing genre of folklore. Throughout the Victorian period, black dog folklore had continued its spread and accelerated rapidly within Britain, so much so that, by 1864, the image of the black dog was so ingrained in British folktales that Scottish author and antiquarian Robert Chambers wrote in his book on the subject of local trivia that there was a popular belief in a spectral dog in almost every county and that few kinds of superstition have more strongly influenced the credulous mind. Chambers described this popular image of the spectral dog as large, shaggy and black, with long ears and tail. It does not belong to any species of living dogs, but is severely said to resemble a hound, a setter, a terrier or a shepherd dog, though often larger than a Newfoundland. It bears different names, but is always alike supposed to be an evil spirit haunting places where evil deeds have been done or where some calamity may be expected. Interestingly, Chambers's piece shows how the folklore had matured and progressed throughout the first half of the Victorian period as he subdivides black dog stories into three distinct categories. Fiends that have assumed the form of dogs, 
the spirits of evil persons who, as part of their punishment, have been transformed into the appearance of dogs, and the more traditional evil spirits that to mimic the sports of men or to hunt their souls have assumed the form and habits of hounds. One story that had become popularised in the 19th century was that of Moddy Doo, a spectral black dog from the Isle of Man that was purported to haunt Peel Castle, a medieval Viking fortification, later built up throughout the years into a sprawling dark stone castle perched on a small outcropping connected to the western coast of the island via a short causeway. The dog appeared in the form of a black spaniel and casually slept in front of the fireplace in the guardroom so often that most of the soldiers had stopped being afraid of its presence, though they still managed to align their shift patterns so that no man was left alone, and when the main gates were locked and the keys were taken down to the captain's quarters at the end of the day, the guard coming on duty would always accompany the outgoing guard. An English poet named George Waldron wrote a story of the Molly Do that, whilst it was published in the 18th century, would gain much of its traction and cement itself into folklore during the 19th century after it was cited as a source of influence for a novel written by Sir Walter Scott in 1823. In the original tale, supposedly repeated to Waldron by the guards who worked on the castle, were introduced to one of their drunk colleagues, whose Dutch courage would lead to his fatal downfall. One night, a fellow being drunk, and by the strength of his liquor, rendered more daring than ordinary, laughed at the simplicity of his companions, and though it was not his turn to go with the keys, would needs take the office upon him to testify his courage. All the soldiers endeavoured to dissuade him, but the more they said, the more resolute he seemed, and swore that he desired nothing more than Moddy Do would follow him, as it had done for the others, for he would try if it were dog or devil. After having talked in a very probate manner for some time, he snatched up the keys and went out of the guard room. In some time after his departure, a great noise was heard, but nobody had the boldness to see what occasioned it, till the adventurer returning, they demanded the knowledge of him, but as loud and noisy as he had been at leaving them, he was now become sober and silent enough, for he was never heard to speak more, and though all the time he lived, which was three days, He was entreated by all who come near him, either to speak, or, if he could not do that, to make some signs by which they might understand what had happened to him. Yet nothing intelligible could be got from him, only that by the distortion of his limbs and features it might be guessed that he died in agonies more than is common in a natural death. After the strange death of the guard, the passage that the dog used to enter the chambers every night was sealed up putting an end to the sightings of the Moddy Doo, though other black dogs have been sighted around the Isle of Man right up until the late 20th century. By 1850, the black dog, and in particular the East Anglian Old Shuck, was featuring in the newly published quarterly Notes and Queries, a scholarly journal with a wide focus of subjects relating to English literature, history and antiquarianism, as well as a considerable number of discussions on folklore and folk tales. In the piece, the description is of an immense beast with fiery eyes, traits that would become common throughout Victorian writing that began to accept the folk narrative that the spectral image of a black dog was something endemic to the English countryside. With the rapid industrialisation that had been going on throughout the century, Victorian folklorists commonly dug into the past to unearth stories of rural traditional folklore in efforts to maintain an indigenous national identity and a feeling of historical authenticity that many felt was quickly diminishing with every new advancement in technology and every boundary expansion of the crowded and sprawling cities. At the same time, the snobbish representation of rural superstition and ignorance never quite left, and as such, stories of the black dog thrived in both Victorian folklore and literature. The countryside was the home of the dark other, an isolated landscape full of mystery, and a theme that played perfectly into the gothic horror, another booming aesthetic that also reflected many similar anxieties of the day, manifesting perhaps most famously in the aforementioned Hound of the Baskervilles. In Troller's Gill, a limestone gorge deep in the Yorkshire Dales, earlier stories of the Barguest were published in 1888, which, just like the Black Dog of Bungay, has long been suspected influence of Conan Doyle's famous work. Half a mile in length, the sheer limestone walls of the gorge tower over everything that surrounds them as they carve through the wild landscape in what was described as a wild, weird and lonely spot. 
The bar guest of Troller Gill was a common sight throughout the 19th century to those that lived in the area, who described it as a large dog with saucer-like eyes as bright as fire. The dog apparently dragged a chain behind it that had been tied around its neck. The story survives primarily through a poetic ballad that tells the story of a young man, a practitioner of magic, who visited the gorge one night in order to seek out the legendary creature, hoping to witness it for himself. As the church bells tolled midnight behind him, he made his way out into the moor and clambered down into the ravine. Wind whistled between the rocks as he crept quietly down the path carved between the two sheer rock faces until he reached an old yew tree where he rested, but not before snapping a branch down from the tree in order to carve a protective circle in the ground. Sitting down with his back to the tree, he called out into the dark for the spectral hound to appear before him. And a dreadful thing from the cliff did spring, and its wild bark filled around. Its eyes had the glow of the fires below, "'Twas the form of the spectre hound. "'In a flash of hellfire, the dog struck through the man's magical defences "'and tore him asunder with great claws. "'The following morning, a shepherd came across his body "'and returned it to the town, "'where the ballad was supposedly penned "'in order to warn others of doing the same. "'Many of the 19th century tales "'were far more gruesome and violent than earlier tales "'and focused on the ghostly nature of the dogs, "'stalking their victims through shadowy rural locales. Curiously, the 20th century saw another change in black dog folklore, as more and more of the dogs became ghostly spectres, and it could be argued that they grew less beastly and more dog-like, being compared to standard breeds that were now seen as companions in the popular mind. They also became less associated with ill omen and death, even at times being reported as portents of good fortune and protection. The story of the black dog of Lyme Regis, which haunted an old farmhouse and often sat opposite the farmer by the fireside, is one such example. The farmer, accustomed to the dog's nightly appearances, paid the ghostly image no mind, until, one night, he came home drunk from a neighbour's home where he had spent the night having his courage called into question for not asserting his dominance of the household and chasing the dog away. He took to the spectral canine with a poker, swinging it wildly through the air, and chased it up the stairs, where the dog promptly leapt clean through the ceiling into the attic above. The farmer struck the ceiling with his poker in frustration, which ripped a hole in the plaster and brought down, along with the debris, a curious old chest. The farmer opened it gingerly, unsure of what he was going to find. However, much to his delight, he found it was full of old gold and silver coins. The dog was never seen in the house again, however, it reportedly haunted the lane that ran by the side of his home. Eventually, these tales grew slowly more obscure, until now, where they're seen as something more akin to urban legend, and rarely mentioned outside of horror fiction. Despite this, the remnants of the many hundreds of black dog stories still exist and show how ingrained they have become in English folklore. The haunted lane in Lyme Regis was eventually christened Dog Lane, and the pub at the end of the street took the name of the Black Dog Inn. In every town, village or city where a black dog story can be found, so too can similar names be seen. Pubs, hotels, societies, sports and social clubs can all be seen named the Black Dog, showing the undeniable legacy of the mythology and folklore that has passed wholesale into popular culture, not only in Britain, but across the world, where local interpretations have shaped and formed the familiar motive with their own unique influences. So that was a kind of brief story and intro to black dog folklore, at least black dog folklore in the British Isles. We'll talk a little bit about this after these short advert breaks. This week's sponsors are another podcast, another independent podcast, importantly, uh, called The Art of Crime. And I tell you what, I'll, I'll give you uh, like the, the script that they've asked me to read for this and then I'll kind of give them just a little bit of my own opinion on it because I have listened to it and I really liked it and I definitely think that listeners of Dark Histories will really enjoy it. So um, like the script basically says, uh, The Art of Crime is a brand new history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. Season one is titled The Unusual Suspects, Artists Accused of Being Jack the Ripper. It profiles six renowned artists who have fallen under suspicion as the Whitechapel murderer, 
Beloved children's author Lewis Carroll is one of the best known to us today. Joining him, among others, are the theatrical wig maker and costume designer who supplied Scotland Yard with disguises whilst it was hunting the Ripper, the actor who originated the dual role of Dr Jackal and Mr Hyde and was playing it in London at the time of the killing spree, and the Victorian pop star, whose brother it so happens, has also been accused of committing the crimes. As you meet each artist, you'll find out who they were, what it was like to work in their trades in the Victorian period, and why they've been nominated as Ripper candidates. Then there is a larger question. Why have artists, especially great artists, proven so attractive as suspects? So I, I think you can probably tell from that script that I obviously really liked this uh, premise for a podcast. And so, it, so I, I um, gave it a listen. Just to, uh, So far, I've only listened to the first episode, uh, just a bit of like transparency. But I subscribed to it straight away. And uh, straight away, I was like, I'm really glad that as a sponsor, that this is something that I'm pushing because I just think it will... Like say, if you're interested in dark histories, I think you really like it. It's structured in a similar sort of way, I feel like, and um, and they really seem to focus on the the deep dive aspect of sort of uh, you know pulling into the little details and stuff. So I think that that script is is really great that they've given me to read. I think that really covers the base as well. But I ju- I just want to really add that like um, if you're really into like just I don't want to say unnecessary details, but because I do the same thing with dark histories. If you're really interested in basically some kind of like really deep dives and, and pulling things apart, um, then then this podcast is is really good for that and will really uh, do it for you. So so yeah, um, I, I I'm glad that they sponsored the show today. It's called The Art of Crime, and uh, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And they've also got a website called. Um, artofcrimepodcast.com and uh you, they've also got a uh, facebook and instagram uh f- i assume from the same the art of crime uh i i like i say i i really like the podcast and um yeah i i it's just such an easy recommendation this is the easiest sponsorship ever probably um yeah i i think uh, listeners of dark histories will, will enjoy it so yeah i mean if you like the Victorian period, if you like uh, Jack the Ripper story, um, if you like sort of unique takes on the Jack the Ripper story, then go for it. So I, I've listened to the first episode; it was brilliant, and I, I will be listening to the rest uh, over the next few days. Um, now I'm kind of on my like, sort of couple of days off from dark histories. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of give it a bit of a binge. I think myself. Like I say, if you want to go check it out, it's called The Art of Crime. Uh, so you can subscribe to it on like any uh, podcast. Uh, app that you've got and uh of course if you just go to their website artofcrimepodcast.com you'll find links to everything there it's quite a nicely uh it's quite a fancy nice looking website as well so yeah uh go check it out cheers so yeah as i mentioned it, it's kind of today's episode it was more of a, a sort of brief intro and focused heavily on sort of british interpretation of black dog folklore it's one that I'd wanted to do for a really long time. And I think I, I kind of right from the start, I, I wanted to focus on, on the British aspect of it because I think it's a side that has always um, sort of appealed to me. And like I said, I've been wanting to do this episode for a really long time, but a couple of the books that I wanted to get for it were both out of print. So they just took a really long time to get, but I did actually manage to end up getting them. So it's it's really good to um, sort of do the story now and, and, and sort of look into it a little bit more. So I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about um, something that I didn't put in the episode because it's really it's my own sort of musings um, and theories. But like I, I, I thought I wanted to, I wanted to sort of talk about like where Black Dog's stories have gone nowadays because to me I feel like they've sort of morphed into something slightly different now and they're very um, much looked at akin to sort of urban legends like i mentioned in the episode or i don't think they're super common anymore um and i think this is for a couple of reasons i think i think partly it's because we have less rural areas in england there's less true wilderness in england than ever before and so that sort of fear of the wilderness has has disappeared some and I also think it's because we've grown as a society and become slightly more rational these days. And I think because of that, you know, like the idea of it being the devil and and, and things like this and the, or the ghost of, you know, evil people, um, 
I think largely that sort of, you know, slipped by the way. So I don't think people generally tend to believe that sort of stuff anymore. And so because of that, my feeling is that black dog folklore has sort of morphed into a different type of folklore in, in Britain, which is um, that of the big cats. And I don't know if you know about um, big cats in, in the British Isles, but there's a, a sort of developing, I guess, sort of folklore around that. And and it's basically the idea that there are whole groups of big cats, um, uh, leopard cats, I think, like black leopards or something, uh, that live in the English countryside and they feed off the deer and stuff. Um in the English countryside and we just don't see them because they're um, very shy animals, but they, they are out there. And there is some evidence to suggest that it might be true. And there are people that genuinely go all in with these theories. And there are other people that sort of just deny it outright and say it's impossible to be true. And, and in a way, I think it's quite a good reflection of uh, Bigfoot in the USA where um, they're both sort of serve a similar role in the popular imagination and in our psyche. But the but the interesting thing, I think, when you look at the big cats is that actually when you look at it as a sort of myth or a folklore story or whatever, it's one that's based in rationality, you know, or purports to be based in rationality. If you So there's a podcast called Big Cat Conversations. And if you listen to that, the guy is very, um, you know, grounded in sort of science and uh sort of biology and and he he speaks and he speaks about these big cats in a way that's very uh rational you know uh, on the surface it's very rational this podcast is great by the way if you if you want to go check it out it's called big cat conversations and it's um a, a guy who's sort of really into big cats and he gets uh guests on to come and talk about their big cat sightings in in, in the british isles it's it's a, an interesting podcast it's funny it's uh you know, it's a bit like it's, uh, Sasquatch Chronicles. And like I say, they, I feel like the two things sort of are very similar in many respects. So anyway, my theory, getting back to it, is that the the black dog folklore that has persisted for like centuries and centuries has now got to the point where most people just aren't going to believe it. And so this kind of rise of the big cat folklore has kind of come up and really replaced it in a way where they both serve exactly the same purpose they both for all intents and purposes are the same thing except from the big cats remove all semblance of supernatural or paranormality from the tale basically because it all becomes you know like that perhaps these cats got to england they were in you know victorian menageries and had escaped or Perhaps they're just, you know, they were indigenous once upon a time and now they just are, you know, and now they're just thriving again in, in, and stuff like that. So, you know, it, I feel like that's where black dog folklore has maybe gone. And I, I didn't want to sort of get into this in the episode because I, I don't know if anyone's done any work on this. I've not really looked into it. Like I say, this is just my own sort of feelings on it. Um, so that's sort of where I feel like it's gone now, um, at least in, in Britain. I feel like it's say we don't really i say i don't think it's really taken seriously anymore and i feel like these big cats kind of have sort of moved in and sort of taken over or it's morphed into the sort of big cat uh sort of folklore instead um but as for the you know the black dog stories they're brilliant i i i absolutely love them and i think it's a really fascinating i think what's really fascinating about them is that they are a global phenomenon like i say this episode where i mostly dealt with them um coming from you know the british isles but they are a global phenomena and i think that says something really interesting about the, the sort of human condition where clearly there is a um a sort of gravitation to have that fear of the wilderness and of uh the, like rural isolation and you know the fear of the dark and the fear of death and things like that i think it all and i think it's really interesting how it's all manages to sort of uh, manifest in these quite similar ways um you know very probably because there's a sort of large feedback loop going on where you know we're all kind of hearing stories of other th- from other countries that feed into our own sort of folklore and 
you know, we eventually we all sort of bleed into one another's folklore. Um, because, you know, the, the, the black dog thing was a, a sort of pan-European thing uh, back in the day. And I think back then that, you know, the stories did bleed into one another and, and influence one another. Um, so anyway, I don't really know what I'm talking about anymore. So I'm going to stop. Um, thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, so I hope my voice wasn't too bad. Um, I, I actually quite like my voice when I've got a cold. So hopefully, it, you know, it was fine. And hopefully by next episode, my voice will be completely back to normal anyway. So, you know, no worries. Uh, if you would like to contact me, you can do so. The email address is, as always, contact at darkhistories.com. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all of those things. And all of those links you can find, you can see in the show notes. Or if you go to darkhistories.com, you'll be able to find them there. You can also uh, find links both in the show notes and on the website of ways that you can support the show if you would like to, as mentioned at the start of the episode, so I won't bang on about here. I've got a patron, and if you'd like to support, that would be great. If not, no worries. So yes, thank you very much for listening. I'll be back in a couple of weeks, which is very exciting. Uh, Until then, take care, sleep tight.